is my last Sunday in this series, and I will I will miss I will be disappointed to see Cody's wonder at the opening slides go away. But uh, <laughs> today, wild lions are found almost exclusively uh, on the continent of Africa. Uh, even though at one time their range was much wider over much of Europe uh, and parts of Asia as well. Males can weigh up to over 400 pounds, uh, females uh, somewhere around 280 to 300. Um, they can eat, this was staggering to me, they can eat almost 90 pounds in one sitting. That's incredible. Um, they can run up to 50 miles per hour. They have 30 teeth. 12 incisors, four canines, and 14 carnations. I have no idea what that is. It does not sound pleasant. Um, <laughs> their claws measure up to an inch and a half long. Um, and, and not only do they have teeth and they have claws, even their tongues have little rafts on them called papillae. And uh, they're just these sharp points on their tongues to help just lick that meat right off the bones. A roar from a lion can be heard up to five miles away. And just for a little bit of reference, that's like from right here to East Wells Road, or from right here up to the, the terminus of North Street, okay? With statistics like those, I think it behooves God's people to sit up and take notice when God compares himself to that kind of an animal. What does the lion-like side of, of God entail? What does that involve? Well, in our main text here this morning, we're going to see that the lion-like God is the superior ally. The lion-like God dominates enemies, and the lion-like God roars for us to return. Turn to Isaiah 31. We were in Isaiah last week as well. But let me just kind of refresh you on this very big, very weighty, divinely inspired prophetic book. It's written by the prophet Isaiah, roughly the 8th century BC. And it was written specifically to the southern kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of Judah. And there is a lot that goes on within this book. Um, it, it's, it's calling God's people to repentance right there and right then and as well as now. It proclaimed forthcoming justice, and it also promised God's ultimate deliverance through a promised Messiah. And here in Isaiah 31, what we see is God actually addressing some current events at the time. We'll get into those a little bit as we continue on through the text. But while God, through the prophet Isaiah, is addressing current events, he's also speaking to the future as well. And if you pressed on to Isaiah 32, you'd see very much what I mean by that. And so this book, while both addressing things going on at that moment, address things to come, address some things that have already happened, and address even more future events still. So with no further ado, let's jump into Isaiah 31 and read through that here this morning. God, through the prophet Isaiah, says, Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help, who rely on horses, who trust in the multitude of their chariots and in the great strength of their horsemen, but do not look to the Holy One of Israel or, or seek help from the Lord. Yet he too is wise and can bring disaster. He does not take back his words. He will rise up against the house of the wicked, against those who help evildoers. But the Egyptians are men and, and not God. Their horses are flesh and not spirit. When the Lord stretches out his hand, he who helps will stumble. He who is helped will fall. Both will perish together. This is what the Lord says to me. As a lion growls, a great lion over his prey, and though a whole band of shepherds is called together against him, he's not frightened by their shouts or disturbed by their clamor. So the Lord Almighty will come down to do battle on Mount Zion and on its heights. Like birds hovering overhead, the Lord Almighty will shield Jerusalem. He will shield it and deliver it. He will pass over it and rescue it. Return to him, you have, have, who have so greatly revolted against, O Israelites. For in that day, every one of you will reject the idols of silver and gold your sinful hands have made. Assyria will 
fall by a sword that is not of man. A sword not of mortals will devour them. They will flee before the sword, and their young men will be put to forced labor. Their stronghold will fall because of terror. At sight of the battle standard, their commanders will panic, declares the Lord, whose fire is in Zion and whose furnace is in Jerusalem. The lion-like God, as we complete this series of the wild God, Here now in Isaiah 31, the lion-like side of God. And what we see here first in verses 1 through 3 is that the lion-like God is the superior ally. Okay, the superior ally. Now see, at the time of this prophecy, the southern kingdom of Israel was afraid it was going to be overrun and conquered by a powerhouse nation at that time. Um, One of the superpowers in that moment was the Assyrian Empire. And they were threatening Judah. And Judah was so afraid, they considered actually making an alliance with Egypt, which if you go back just a little bit in the Old Testament, that's a nation that at one time had been Israel's oppressors. And here they are so panic-stricken, they're actually thinking about making an alliance with this sinful nation. And to this temptation, to this thought, God says, whoa, and we covered that word a few weeks ago. The meaning in Hebrew is akin to the meaning in Greek as it is in English. Hey, watch out. Heads up. Take notice of this. Whoa, woe to what? To those who look for salvation apart from God. To those who trust in foreign alliances and earthly strength, but do not seek God or even seek his help. Continuing on in verses 2 through the beginning of 3, we see the power of God's spirit. We don't own wisdom, but in fact, the wisdom we possess is due to the author of all wisdom. We don't own power of destruction. If you go through Exodus, Egypt's own history attests to the supreme power of, of God. Unlike ourselves who break our promises, the Lord keeps his. And yet God's people have put their hope in flesh, which wears out, which grows tired. It expires. But the Lord God is from everlasting to everlasting. And the result of this, as we see in the rest of verse 3, is that this nation is just leaning on a broken crutch. God is against wicked nations, and he's also against those who trust in wicked nations. God's people are, are trying to lean on a lesser power in Egypt for support against this very real foe. But these powers, they're they're like a splintered walking stick or or a broken crutch. When weight's applied to them, they shatter, and both the crutch and the person leaning on it both fall to the ground. Now, let me me make something clear here, okay? God is not against being reasonably prepared, okay, for catastrophes or for adversity. Okay, God's not against that. That's not what this passage is saying. As a matter of fact, in Nehemiah, a fantastic book, if you've never read through it, I I highly recommend that. But Nehemiah, when he returns back to Jerusalem and he begins rebuilding the walls, okay, he meets some strong, ardent resistance to that. And there's some not so veiled threats made against him and his, his people. And what does Nehemiah do? I love this. I love, I love Nehemiah's theology laid out in one sentence here. Okay, Nehemiah 4.9. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Fully trusting in God and taking every reasonable precaution that was at his disposal. And just as another point of clarification, before Nehemiah did anything, if you look through Nehemiah chapter 1, before he took any action, he he prayed and he fasted. But even at the Last Supper before Christ completed his mission on the cross, in Luke 22, Jesus tells his disciples, he said, when I sent you out without purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they answered. And he said to them, but now if you have a purse, take it, and also a bag, and if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. Nothing wrong with taking preparations, taking certain precautions, okay, reasonable ones, certainly. 
where preparation becomes a problem, where it becomes more than a problem, where it becomes sin, is where we put our faith and our trust and our reliance in and over and above our faith, our trust, and our reliance in God. Let me give you a few examples. Because in the abstract, it's easy for us to think, well, that's, Trev, don't sweat it, man. That's not me. Let's, let's just take some biblical looks here. You know, for example, some of us, you know, if we're really being honest with ourselves, and sometimes that's hard to do, our confidence really is in our military. We have one of the greatest militaries, if not the greatest military in the world. But, you know, if you look at Psalm 20, David, a man who has fought so many battles, so many wars, what does David say? He says, now this I know. The Lord gives victory to who? To his anointed. He answers him from his heavenly sanctuary with victorious power of his right hand. Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Some of us, if we're being honest, we are trusting in our, in our bank accounts and our 401ks. But Solomon, who is far wealthier than anybody here that I know, he says this in Ecclesiastes. He says, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. That's why Paul, in his letter to Timothy, says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. We've been reminded of that, haven't we? Boy, the dollar does not go as far as it used to. Paul goes on, But to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Some of us, especially if we're not feeling well, we're tempted to put our, our full hope and our confidence and our trust in medicine. Friends, there's nothing wrong with seeking medical aid, okay? But it's not where the ultimate hope comes from. I love the story in Mark 5. You know, a large crowd followed and pressed around him. That is Jesus. Jesus is traveling. And a woman was there who'd been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She'd suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him, he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you ask, <laughs> who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Friends, nothing wrong with seeking medical help, and I am so grateful it's there. And as Kim can attest on some of our adventures, I'm extra grateful that it's there, okay? But it's not the end-all, be-all. It is. It's not where we put our final, complete, and whole hope in. And sometimes we want to put our trust in, in our relationships with our friends, earthly relationships. We see this throughout the Gospels. In John 7, no one would say anything publicly about Jesus for fear of the leaders. In John 19, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus, but Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, now he was, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. James answers this after Christ's resurrection and ascension. James, writing to the church, he says, Don't you know, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Jesus himself answers this in Matthew 10. He says, whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Hey, it's not cool to be a Christ follower. It's just not. you're going to be challenged with that. Where you put your hope, where you put your confidence in those relationships or in our relationship with God. 
Some of us put our, our confidence in our, in our government or in our, our leaders and in, in politics and the system. And, you know, if we're really into that, you know, we might point to the, the, the times that Paul used his Roman citizenship to further his ministry. And those are, those are certainly biblical examples. It's true, Paul occasionally used his citizenship to advance the gospel. Even so, he was still arrested by that very same government and, and likely, as best as we can understand, executed by that very same government. What's more, friends, Paul makes it abundantly clear that that is not where he puts his trust. And that is not where he puts his hope. That's why he tells the Philippian church, which was a city that really prided itself on its, on its political status. He tells the church there, he says, our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there. From there. Not from the governing authorities around us. Our Savior is from heaven. I won't belabor this point anymore. But I think most of us would agree it's a good idea to have some emergency equipment on hand. You know, we have some emergency equipment here at the church. You know, we have AEDs, we have med kits. Okay, maybe at your home you've got some. MREs, if you don't know what that is, that's a meal ready to eat, okay? I have them, all right? <laughs> and if you're hungry enough, they taste delicious, okay? But you better be in an emergency or they will taste terrible. No, it's fine to have some emergency equipment on hand. It's fine to have some precautions, okay? But, but have you ever wondered what the actual reliability of those things are? You know, in 2017, nearly 38 million kid fire extinguishers were recalled after failing to activate in the middle of a fire emergency. What? Yes. Yeah. And in addition to, in addition to just failing to activate, the nozzles on this particular model of fire extinguishers was actually detaching so that it was injuring the person trying to use the fire extinguisher. Okay? One death was reported, okay, when it failed to activate a car accident. But in total, there have been 400 reports for this model of extinguishers that have failed to activate and also in the process injuring 16 others. And there's also been 91 reports of property damage. Friends, it's good to have these things, okay? But it is not where we put our hope. It is not where we put our trust and it is not where we put our confidence. Amen. Nothing wrong with reasonable preparations. There's a lot wrong with putting our, our trust in those things in place of God. Doing so is like leaning on a broken crutch. Eventually it breaks and, and we fall with it. How do we know if, if we actually are leaning on a broken crutch? Well, there's probably a few ways to figure that out, but let me just suggest a few litmus tests, if you will. I'd encourage you to monitor your thoughts, your words, and your actions before, during, and after your next crisis, okay? Maybe you're in the middle of a crisis right now, and if you're not, don't worry, one's coming, okay? <laughs> That's just life, all right? Monitor your, your thoughts, your words, and your actions before, during, and after. How do you react? When in worry, when in doubt, run around, scream and shout. Is that, is that how you react? Okay. That should be the motto for some of us, okay, for being honest. What are your go-tos? I want you to take that seriously, please. What, what are your go-tos? When everything comes crumbling down, oh, I got to get to that. That's a good way to identify what your crutches are. Study what you're worried about. What are you worried about? Worried about money? Are you worried about politics? What is it that you're worried about? I would also encourage you to consider how you prepare for adversity. Consider how you prepare for crises. Consider how you prepare for whatever calamity. 
Is God a part of that preparation? Let me put that another way. Is honoring God a part of that preparation? How level with you. And this isn't in my notes, so this is off script. So whoo, let's look out, okay? But you know, I've met some professing Christians that you know have taken a lot of preparations for, for potential calamities in, in the future. And that's fine. And you know, as, as they're telling me everything they've done and, and everything that, that they're they're ready, okay? <laughs> Friends, I gotta tell you, all I hear is me, 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 okay? Are you actually planning that on sharing with those in need? My dad actually asked that to such a person, okay? We grew up pretty rural, so we got a lot of Christians like that. My dad asked that to a lady. What? It was like a deer in the headlights. There was no concept of actually honoring God in that preparation. Just looking out for number one, okay? Consider how we prepare. I won't camp out on this anymore. But think about that. Are you preparing in such a way that you are seeking to honor God in the middle of that catastrophe? I'll let you take that one home. Second point. Second truth we're going to see here is that the lion-like God dominates enemies. We see this in verses 4 through 5. What are many against the one? Nothing. See, this is what God says about himself through the prophet Isaiah. When it comes to rescuing his people, God is not just a lion. He is a great lion growling over his prey. And even when shepherds gather together and try to scare the lion-like God off, those scare tactics, it's a futile effort. He remains unmoved, unshaken, undisturbed. That is how the lion-like God is when he comes to save his people. And here in verse 5, we see previous sermons in this series brought back to light when we see the eagle of the Lord and the hen of heaven spread his wings to shelter his people. God will protect them. He'll pass over them. It's an Exodus to, or a reference to Exodus 12 and ultimately bring about their rescue. When it comes to total domination, athletic games offer some vibrant illustrations. In the NFL, on December 8th, 1940, the Chicago Bears trounced the Washington Redskins by a score of 73 to 0, the largest margin defeat in NFL history. In the NHL, on January 23rd, 1944, the Detroit Red Wings achieved the highest goal differential by any team in a game with 15 goals against the New York Rangers. In the NBA, on December 2nd, 2021, this is more recent, the Memphis Grizzlies beat the Oklahoma City Thunder 152 to 79. Again, the largest point differential in NBA history. Major League, League Baseball, ooh, Major League Baseball, there we go, going way back, 1911, the Cincinnati Reds beat the Boston Wrestlers 26 to 3. And finally, I had to sneak some, sneak some UFC in there, okay? And this one was a personal favorite because I actually got to watch this fight. Uh, on July 6, 2019, Jorge Masvidal knocked out Ben Askren in just five seconds into the fight. It was, it was incredible to watch. I'll be honest with you. Uh, you can all think less of me, and that's okay. But it was, it was an epic and epically short fight to watch. Five seconds, setting the quickest knockout record in UFC fight history. Friends, those are some big, vibrant examples of some dominating victories. But you know, as sound and as convincing, as stupendous as those victories were, friends, understand this now, they do not even begin to compare with the past and even the future victories of the lion-like God. Through the power of God's Holy Spirit, as I referenced this earlier before, Isaiah prophesies to both current and future events. And the promised deliverance for, for Israel here in Isaiah 31, it takes place just a few chapters later in Isaiah 36 and 37. 
So the question becomes, here in the 21st century, does God still rescue his people in mighty ways? Or is that just something for God's people in the Old Covenant? Is there such a prophecy of rescue for the church? The answer is a resounding yes. Friends, the book of Revelation is a beautiful, it's an inspired book of the Bible. And there are many parts that I'll confess I do not fully understand. But here's something that I do understand. After all the suffering, after all the tribulation, after all the wickedness that takes place, God wins. God wins, and he wins in a lion-like way. And let me just give you a picture of what was revealed to John and now revealed to us in Revelation 19. John, as he receives this revelation from God, he says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and his head on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe, dipped in blood, and his, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And skipping down, John says, Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured. And with it, the false prophet who had performed the signs on its behalf, the rest were killed with the sword coming out of the mouth of the rider on the horse. Friends, that's a dominating victory. So the generous church, permit me to mix some metaphors here, okay? At times, it might feel, right here, right now, feel being the key word, it might feel like a bunch of rogue shepherds are winning the day. I understand that. I understand why it might feel that way. They make a big noise. They shout, they hurl insults, they hurl rocks. They might even kill a few of God's sheep, though not completely. I recommend you turn to Matthew 10 and 1 Corinthians 15 for that. But you need to understand this, though there's some rogue shepherds running around, making a big noise, making a big sting, and causing, causing some, some legit calamity. Know this, the lion is coming. The lion is coming. Hey, I don't know when, but the lion is coming. Only this lion doesn't attack sheep. This lion attacks miscreant shepherds. Think about that one. Shepherds who wish to harm, to harass, and to rustle God's flock. That lion's coming for them. So when you hear the shouts, when you feel the rocks, when you see or hear about other sheep of God's pasture being killed, remember the lion's coming, and it is going to be a dominating victory, unlike anything any of us have ever seen in our lives. I hope that provides some encouragement. Final truth we're going to examine is that the lion like God roars for us to return. And we see that in verses six through nine. Now, interestingly, here in verses six through seven, this prophecy in Isaiah 31 comes full circle to interlock with verses one through three. What do I mean by that? Well, what we understood as we look at the context is that God's people had made a, a, an idol out of international alliances, out of political savvy to their rejection of God. Why? Well, because they were afraid. <laughs> Just to put it simply, they were afraid. And they had little faith, if, if, if any faith. And what does God say in verse 6, though, to this nation that has turned its back on him? The lion like God calls his people to come back. They've rebelled against the God of gods and the king of kings by their multitude of sins. And if you go through Isaiah, you see it's murder, lies, injustice, idolatry, oppression. And yet, 
And yet the lion-like God calls them to return to him. Even though they have rebelled against him, he beckons them back to himself. Not to be punished, but to be saved. That's remarkable. And in verse 7, what we see here is a righteous discard upon returning, upon repenting, and upon coming back to the one true king. God's people realize the foolishness of the idols that they've made themselves to serve, and they cast them away. And then finally in 8 through 9, we see a little glimpse of what's to come. See, Isaiah, if you continue on into 36 and 37, Isaiah prophesied to the king at that time, Hezekiah, that God would save him and his people from the Assyrian army. And he does. He does. But even here now in Isaiah 31, God gives his people a glimpse of what's coming. This powerhouse, superpower nation will eventually be destroyed. Not by the might of man, but by the designs and the plans and the sovereignty of the lion-like God. Assyria, this nation that oppressed and tortured and killed and enslaved everyone who came into its path, they're going to be brought low. The poachers are going to become the prey. The oppressors are going to be the ones enslaved. Their strongholds are going to fall because of fear. And the commanders are going to panic at the sight of God's justice. And God is not going to let the fire die out in himself or in his people. I want to turn your attention there to verse 7. Because there's an indisputable, indisputable correlation between God's salvation and a casting away of idols. You know, in Acts 4, we read about Joseph, a, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. And he sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Trev, what do you mean by that? What, how on earth is that a casting away of idols? Well, we need to listen to that, that verse very closely in connection with the Old Testament. You see, Barnabas was a Levite. And what we understand from Deuteronomy 10 and reiterated again for us in Deuteronomy 18 is that the Levites were not to own property. God told them not to buy property. And Barnabas here, upon receiving the gospel sees this thing that he's holding and he gives it up and he casts it away. Another example still is in Acts 19. Paul, he entered the synagogue and he spoke boldly for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. And this went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul and And many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, it came to 50,000 drachmas, which was approximately a day's wage. And in this way, Luke tells us, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. A correlation between God's salvation and a casting away of idols. You know, every spring, every spring, around roughly 3,000 hikers set out from Springer Mountain, Georgia, with their boots and their hearts pointed towards Katahdin, Maine. Talking about the Appalachian Trail, which runs by real close to us here, actually. It's the longest hiking only trail in the world that goes through 14 states over roughly about 2,190 miles. Interestingly, only about a quarter of those who set out to through hike actually complete it. Through hiking the Appalachian Trail is not for the faint of heart. The elevation gain and loss of doing the entire thing is the, the feet equivalent of hiking uh, Everest 16 times, just for, just for some perspective. Between the distance of the trail and the elevation gains and losses, losses, what hikers do and don't take with them is very, very, very important. And for most hikers, and it happens right around week three or week four, what most hikers realize around week three or week four of their trek is that they are carrying a lot of stuff that they don't need. 
a lot of stuff they don't need and yet is adding a ton of unnecessary weight to their packs. And so at a way station or at a nearby town, they stop and they start offloading items. And there's some common items that are offloaded, extra clothes, surplus food, books, electronics, even bear spray, okay? They just start purging. Why? Well, one, they don't need it. Two, it's adding a bunch of weight. And three, they want to finish. They want to finish this hike. They want to finish this trail. And they do not want the weight of unnecessary items holding them back from winning. Friends, that's what it's like for God's people to cast away their idols. Now, if you've paid any attention to my preaching, and hopefully a little bit at least, you've probably noticed that I make reference to idolatry a lot. I do pretty frequently. There's a good reason for that. One is that consistently throughout Scripture, friends, in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, idolatry is the biggest spiritual hang-up for God's people. Second reason for that is that if we want to see God working through us powerfully, both individually as Christ followers and corporately as a church family, friends, we need to purge ourselves of idols. How do we identify those? Well, it's a lot like identifying the crutches we're leaning on, because here's a spoiler alert for you. Many times, the crutch that we're leaning on is also the idol that we're serving. Some good questions for you to ask yourself in prayer and an openness to a yielding to the Holy Spirit of God. Ask yourselves, what, what do you fear? What you fear, there's a good chance that's an idol for you. What do you respect? What, what do you serve? And what do you put your confidence? Maybe, maybe we need to ask ourselves, what do we turn to for joy or, or for comfort or for peace? The answers could be many. Maybe we just turn to ourselves. Or maybe we turn to escapism. Or maybe we, we turn to success in the workplace or academically or on the sports field. Maybe we turn to our reputation or our, our family or our church family. Friends, none of these things are bad in and of themselves. They are immeasurably destructive, however, if they're turned to, cherished, and served over and above God. Your idols probably aren't my idols. But whatever they are, let's prayerfully root them out and cast them away that God will work mightily through us. I want that for us, and I trust, as Christ followers, you do as well. If you're already living a new life in Christ, the lion like God is the superior ally. There's nothing wrong with making reasonable preparations. We have safety measures and protocols here at the church. We have AEDs, we have med kits, and you know what? I am glad we got them. I really am. But friends, that is not where we put the totality of our hope. Let's monitor our thoughts and our words and our actions before, during, and after our crisis. What are our go-tos? And let's consider how we, how we prepare. Are we preparing to honor God in the middle of a tragedy, in the middle of a crisis, or are we just preparing for ourselves? If you're already living a new life in Christ, remember that the lion-like God dominates enemies. Hey, I get it. There's some rogue shepherds out there that, that make a lot of noise. They hurl rocks, they injure, and they harass God's flock. But the lion's coming. The lion's coming. So when you hear those shouts, when you feel those rocks... Remember, the lion is coming, and he will not be moved. He will not be turned aside from his path, and he will rescue completely. Finally, if you're already living a new life in Christ, the lion, like God, roars for us to return. 
Time and again, God's work of salvation is accompanied by a casting away of idols. What owns the bulk of our fear? What owns the, the bulk of our, uh, our respect, our confidence, our hope, our joy, our thought life? Whatever it is, friends, the lion's share belongs to the lion like God. And if the Holy Spirit of God reveals to us today an idol that we need to cast away, don't delay. Throw it off. If you're not yet living a new life in Christ, just one, one takeaway I want to give you, and, and uh, it's somber and it's serious, but it needs to be heard. Friends, if you're not yet living a new life in Christ, you can receive the Lamb of God now or the lion-like God later. There is no smoother way for me to put that to you. Christ came, the Lamb of God came in gentleness and meekness and in humility, and he laid down his life to reconcile us to God. But he's gonna come again. And we got just a glimpse of the kind of power in which he will return. And friends, I, it is my hope and it is my prayer that you will reconcile through the Lamb of God for meeting the lion like God. Hey, thanks for being here. Thanks for worshiping with us. Let's close with a hymn.